Welcome everybody to the latest in our Advancing Leadership webinar series. My name is Zoe Arden, I'm a fellow at CISL and I'm the chair of these webinars. So delighted to have so many of you with us today. We've had 540 people sign up this webinar. So welcome if you're joining us live and welcome if you are um, listening to the re this recording, watching this recording afterwards. So today's topic is communicating for leadership, influence and impact. And I'm absolutely delighted to have two expert communicators join me on the panel. Um, and as you would expect with the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, they are expert communicators who are also very much focused on social and environmental impact. So first, let me introduce Mark. Uh, Mark is Director of Brand and Social Purpose at Edelman. Mark's career started in advertising. Um, he learned the incredible power of storytelling to influence people and outcomes very early on and has worked across brand strategy and sustainability innovation, um, worked with many big brands to help them maximize their commercial brand value and how to scale social impact. Um, he's worked in creative agencies, international NGOs, so he was head of international marketing and communications for RED and worked for brands as head of sustainability marketing for the likes of Telefonica. Now Edelman, he's their director of brand and social purpose, and works with some of the, the world's uh, best known brands. So Apple, Unilever, Ikea, Starbucks, O2, et cetera. Um, so welcome, Mark. Hello, and, good morning, everyone. And I'd also like to uh, welcome Anna Lungley. Um, Anna is Global Head of Social Impact at Denzu Aegis Network. And um, Anna is also a Senior Associate at CISL. And she works very much at the intersection of strategy, communications, and sustainability. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Denzu Aegis Network, there she's responsible for embedding purpose at the heart of business culture and operations, uh, reporting directly into the CEO, um, she, that her work includes setting and delivering um, Dan's social and environmental goals. Um, and Dan has 45,000 specialists dedicated to changing the role, the relationship that brands have with consumers. Um, prior to um, joining Denzu Aegis, um, Anna was Sustainable Business Director for BT, and in fact, we're, we're old colleagues from BT. So welcome, Anna. Thank you, lovely to be here. Super, so just a, a quick recap. Um, please feel free to ask questions and post comments through, through the chat functionality throughout the webinar. We'll be monitoring those. And this is a conversation. We're going to make sure that we've got a good 30 minutes um, at the end to answer, with your, answer your questions. And thank you for those of you who've submitted questions in advance. The final webinar in this series um, is next month, and that's looking at common leadership dilemmas and solutions. And last month's webinar, many of you joined us to talk about personal leadership in action. And that was a really fantastic conversation. I encourage you to look at that um, if you get the chance. Okay, so this is our outline for today. So why is communication an essential leadership skill? What's the context that we're operating in? So how has the role of business changed? Um, and then society wants more, but consumers also want more as well. So how are brands responding to that? Um, and obviously a really important question that we are going to address head on and has come up in many of the questions, which is how do we communicate in a crisis? How do we behave in a crisis? So firstly, um, a, a, a quick point on why is communication an essential leadership skill? Why are we talking about communicating for influence and impact as part of our advancing leadership series. Well, we know that actually communication plays a critical role in creating positive change. It helps build more inclusive communities and can shape society. And communication actually maximizes our influence and impact to drive meaningful change. So we often put it in the leadership soft skills bucket, but what we know from our programs at CISL is actually quite hard to do right. 
Um, so, and how is how is communication um, delivered in a way that could ensure that it's an essential leadership skill? So, how can we communicate? We can do that by collaborating and co-creating new innovative solutions at a systems level. Really important. It's around how we embed and cultivate purpose-driven cultures that foster experimentation and learning. It's how we develop powerful stories that inspire and motivate others. And we'll be sharing some examples of those later. And it's how we actually engage with stakeholders and unlock the benefits of divergent and inclusive thinking. So, so it's, it's perhaps much broader than, than some of us initially think. Okay, so moving on. Um, and how does communication enable the future we want? So um, some of you who've joined this webinar will be already be in the CISL network and you would have received an email from Dame Polly Curtis at the beginning of the month um, talking about CISL's forthcoming new leadership platform, The Future We Want. And communication is, is an, for influence and impact is that absolutely at the heart of this new leadership platform. So a few ways few ways in which it is at the heart so it's how we listen to each other it's how we explore new possibilities and test and bait and challenge ideas which is an essential part of this this leadership platform it's how we coordinate responses and, and as dame polly mentioned in in her in her blog it's how we make space for compelling narratives and evidence to be drawn together it's how we create a vision of a sustainable future which is absolutely the part at the heart of a CISL's forthcoming leadership platform. How we finally, leading on to what Mark's going to talk about, it's very much how we show up as leaders. So, so over to you, Mark. Great, thank you, Zoe. Um, so I'm going to jump into that role of leaders, particularly probably from the private sector. And where do where do people expect us to turn up? Um, whether it be our colleagues, whether it be our um, partners, whether it be our customers and consumers, whether it just be our families at home. Um, and we're going to talk about the change of dynamic we face, including probably, interesting there, as I mentioned about the ability to listen and listen to what is expected of you. Um, that's going to be a theme that comes through loudly, I think, in lots of the commentary today. So we're going to be looking at data that's pulled from Edelman Trust, and that's been going about 20 years. So the information you're seeing here is actually from about 2 million people being questioned in 27 markets over that time. And a bit of context, which actually is quite um, a nice bridge to what we face today. Edelman Trust started in the Battle of Seattle. So those of us on the call who are old, old enough to remember, that was a WTO conference over in Seattle when um, protesters were on the streets and it really caught um, the attendees out. And the attendees, of course, were leadership of mainly the political and um, in business world. And our CEO was actually attending that, and like everyone else, they didn't see it coming. Um, and the reason we started looking at trust was to understand who were these people, and why were they so angry, and what was the dynamic between them and the people within the conference, beyond the locked doors, and why was it broken? Why did they feel they had to take to the streets to try and get their message out there? Um, so that's where it started, and we've been looking at trust ever since. And Trust in that time has changed a lot. There are various, obviously, global events that take place. There are huge economic events that take place, all of which play into changing dynamics. And when we look at trust, we look at four institutions. We look at the NGO sector, we look at media, we look at business and brands, and uh, we've got one there, NGO and government, of course, and politics. Now, what we've seen most recently, which is really significant, is on this slide which is business is now more trusted than government. And, and for the first time ever in the last survey, business is as trusted as NGOs. But a key difference is business is seen as being more competent than both to actually deliver solutions. It means that the role of business has changed in the world and therefore the role of leaders of business has changed in the world. And the world expects brands and private sectors to do more than just sell. There is a greater expectation and hope on businesses to do more. So when we look at the role of leaders in that space, it means that CEOs are being asked to lead. 76% of people say CEOs should take a lead on change rather than waiting for government. When I said about listening, what we're seeing in government across the world, not in every single market, but certainly across most markets, is a slight failure of government. And that government appears not to be listening as well 
or not being as effective in implementing change that people want to see, while they see the business is doing it more, more capably. Now, when we look at the immediate term, on the right-hand side of this chart here is a survey that's done in 12 markets and completed two, three weeks ago now, that was looking at how brands are turning up in the current crisis. So moving from WTO 20 years ago to current crisis, there is still a need. Now the needs change like to being the more immediate, but the importance of the employer in the society, the trust they have in business to provide solutions is there and very clear what they want you to do. They want to ensure that everyone you touch throughout all of your value chain, directly and indirectly, you take care of in the best possible way. And that should be really the primary purpose of business right now. And which is a change from the past to share information. So we see every audience expects you to do more if you are working in the private sector, every brand. Consumers expect companies to take actions that increase profits, but also improve society. They, they don't see it as being contradictory. They don't see it as being a choice. They see it as being a commitment and expectation of both. And Anna will talk more about what the reward is for companies that have managed to show that. Employees, I think any of you who work in any company or any organization who spent any time talking to the the younger staff coming into your business or organization will vouch for this. Surveys generally show that it's a second question asked, what is your role in the world? What are you doing in the world? How are you improving the state of the world? It's a really important factor of where someone will join you, but more importantly, why they may stay with you. Nine in 10 within companies believe that their CEO should speak out on societal issues. That's a, that's a big change from how leadership was 15 years ago, where generally it was keep your head down unless asked. That's very, very different to today. And investors may be later to the party, but a hugely important um, player now in this um, space. And in fact, really the accelerant of what's driving change. They want to see change. They want to ask questions of your boardroom. They want to ask your leadership, what is the change you're trying to see in the world and what a change you are trying to implement in the world? Um, this is a really important factor going forward for the role of leaders to play in understanding how to articulate that. And why is it all there? Well, first of all, it's because business is being a positive and effective um, force for change, a force for good. They see business as better ideas, with better at innovation. Probably the second column is really important though. They're better at implementing. 53% believe business can do more than government to correct societal ills. And we're gonna come back to that in the current crisis later. What does that mean in the current context? And lastly, but it's really importantly, touch on what we mentioned before about listening, that they believe actually it's easier to mobilize brands than government. It's easier to be heard as a consumer, as a citizen through brands than government. It means, it, do, I, do I want to express myself and my views on the world through the brands I choose, brands I follow, brands I sign with, advocate with, spend my money with, or do I have to wait four years for a time to vote? Now, of course, that is not meant to be the same with represent. Uh, voting systems but it's saying people are expressing themselves in more immediate ways and they think they're being heard in more immediate ways through brands so the call is getting louder if they feel they can mobilize you their call is getting louder this chart is very very striking chart there's some data points here from different years so let me explain what this shows you first of all on the left hand side that bar chart that bar chart we saw last year is really striking really striking that bar chart tells you that only one in five people believe that the system is working for them we saw that last year and it jumped out at us as a very alarming sign something wasn't right many of the people on this call the, the, the careers you're in if you're interested in, in this call if you're following um, this institution you understand some of the tensions at play here on the right hand side is what we saw this year this again was even more striking 56 percent of those people believe capitalism wasn't working today does more harm than good. That's a really, really worrying um, trend to be coming through. But going back to the left, the table, there is hope here. They might feel a sense of injustice. They might have a desire for change, three quarters of those people. But let's look at the last. Only one quarter have a lack of hope. Three quarters believe we can make things better. Three quarters believe we can implement change. Three quarters believe it's in their power to make choices and make change and believe people can mobilize. And the institution they believe can do it best are the brands. So as we look forward, it's really important now more than ever to embrace your new role as leaders in, in brands and business, because it's the expectation on you. It's an ask of you. It's a want of you from both your internal colleagues, 
from your stakeholders, from your supply chain, from regulators, from government, from consumers, from citizens. And actually, if you get there and if you, if you embrace that new role, if you can make it work for you and step forward into the world, there is great benefit from it too. I'm handing over to Anna to explain some of those benefits that you'll see coming through. Yeah, brilliant, Mark. So thank you for, for that, that context sharing. And Anna, now over to you really to talk about how do we have um, impact and influence and what are some of the qualities that we need to be able to do that well? Thank you, thank you, Zoe. So today, as we're sitting here at home doing a live um, panel, saying that the world is changing might feel like an understatement. Global megatrends are reshaping our world. Digital is transforming the way that we work, the way that we live. Um, today, I think everything we do at the moment is online. And business and brands have no choice but to respond and transform their business models to survive. And the advertising and marketing industry is no exception, and the way that we communicate is no exception. And like everyone, we need to go beyond the way that we work and go beyond thinking purely about profit to rethink our purpose and consider the true value that we can create for society. And that puts the role of a communications organisation into, into stark relief. We have a powerful role to play in shaping society, and I think it's something that over the last couple of years, advertising communications agencies have really begun to wake up and realize. The power of communication and how effective communication can be in changing the way that people think, feel or act um, can be a, a huge force for, for good. Um, and obviously it can also be misused as well. And I think it's important not to ignore that. But digital has completely transformed communications. We can communicate at light speed now, um, and we can reach everybody at the perfect time and in the perfect way. So whether you use your mobile phone or you like to consume information over, over sort of um, on-demand television, um, we know your preferred channels of communication. And data, which is the lifeblood of the digital economy, generates insights to gently nudge people in one direction or another. So Zoe, when you go into the supermarket to buy washing powder, you may not actually realize exactly why you want to choose one brand over another, because communication is so subtle and it just nudges and influences behavior, and, the, and that's the power of it. And of course, this, this global communications network connects people to causes and causes to communities. And 20 years ago, we probably wouldn't have heard of Greta Sandberg. But social media gave her a voice and connected her to millions of school children the world over who amplified their voice with hers um, and importantly took that, that knowledge and that passion back into their own schools and communities. And so we see digital and real life communications really beginning to seamlessly merge. And I think it's been palpable in the pandemic how um, we've seen community groups and neighbours enabled by tools like WhatsApp rallying around pensioners who are, who are in isolation just to make sure that they are looked after and cared for and they have their weekly shop delivered. And digital can give rise to global movements as well. So we were really proud to be um, part of our planet and the distribution of our planet, um, reaching millions of people in a very short space of time and uniting people the world over in a global movement to end plastic pollution. So I think, again, you know, we can see how fast you can communicate in today's digital communication, the power of that communication to reach into all the corners of the globe um, and to really, really affect change. But, but to get that cut through and create impact, it's really important to understand that businesses, brands, governments are no longer in control of the conversation in the way that they might have been previously. Now, the reason for this is clear. For a long time, our relationship with business and brands has been transactional. So brands control the conversation, deciding what to communicate and when um, through advertising or direct marketing. It was very much a one way conversation. But over the last decade, the power balance has shifted. And 10 years ago, two thirds of touch points were brand led, but today, two thirds of touch points are consumer driven. And I think that's something that everyone on this call will recognize. We are much more likely to trust a review of an anonymous stranger on social media than the information that brands or businesses send us directly. And the advent of social media means that citizens are no longer passive. They're no longer consumers in that way. They have a voice and they are using it. And in fact, some people have stopped using that term consumers and stopped talking about prosumers. So what do consumers want from brands? Um, and I think 
has really nicely sort of explained this. Consumers want more from brands. They don't just want that transactional relationship where they're marketed at. If they're going to give you their money, um, or more importantly these days, give them give you their time, they want you to matter to them and have meaning in their lives. They want to interact with organizations, communicate with entities that actually share their values. And this needs to go beyond the narrative. So 78% of consumers expect brands about social change. Um, I think you know Mark has talked about some of these supporting statistics already. 64% of people will actually boycott a brand. So they'll actually stop shopping with them or stop engaging with them if they don't agree with their stand on social issues. And sustainability, of course, is an increasing importance. To really cut through, you need to consider your tone of voice and values. Now, in a super VUCA world where everything is changing and the pace of disruption is exponential, people are prioritizing what I would describe as old fashioned values and human qualities um, that inspire confidence, trust, which we've touched on, empathy, purpose, authenticity. So suddenly your stakeholders, including your clients and your talent, the people that work for you and you value, but also the people you want to attract into your organizations and teams, they care not just how you operate your business, but the role you play in your community and how you treat your people. And that's becoming increasingly important. And what were anonymous businesses are expected to be much more human. So Mark has touched on trust, and I think he'll talk about it in a bit more detail shortly. Um, you can build trust. You can keep your brand promise, deliver on time, maintain quality standards, all the things, again, that we would do as individuals that build our own personal brand and mean that people actually trust us when they work with us. And businesses that build trust have an opportunity in a world where people doubt what they read in the media or potentially doubt the information they receive from governments. The second point is empathy, and I, I do want to talk about this in some depth. It's one of the most powerful tools we have as communicators, and it's often underestimated. In our industry, we often talk about the intention to action gap. Once you have captured a person's attention and you've created a spark of curiosity and even a willingness to act, how do you actually convert that intention into action? And the key is often to create empathy, the ability to communicate with your audience in a way that enables them to feel empathy and connect your cause can trigger action. And of course, that's that's what we're all trying to create here when we want to create influence and impact. And this is an approach we use at lots. So at, at Dempsey, we work with about 80,000 organizations all over the world. I think 89 of the, the world's biggest um, brands um, are clients of ours. Um, and, and it's a tool that we see them deploying very successfully. So when you see campaigns that make your heart lurch, make you roar with laughter or make you cry, um, that's a brand actively creating empathy to try and inspire you to take action. Um, and, and it's a really powerful tool. It's why you remember the John Lewis Christmas app. It's why I will only ever buy Pampers because I think, think P&G's Thank You Mom campaign convinced me that they know, only they know how hard and exhausting it is to actually raise kids and also how rewarding it is. And I still cry every time I watch that. So it's hugely powerful. At Dentsu, during this pandemic, we've actually set up five phases based on the five stages of grief to really understand how people are responding to the current crisis and asking them where they are in their journey and how that's changed over time since the pandemic began. And this has created incredible insights to help brands navigate the emotional storms that consumers are currently weathering. It's also really importantly helped them understand how they can change their messaging over time. So half of millennials and Gen Z say they're paying more attention than ever to how brands are communicating. And at first, generally, and I think we're all going through this together, which is one of the, the incredible things about this pandemic. But at first, I think people were really worried about coping, worried about jobs, um, feeling very isolated, how to take care of loved ones. But as they move from that kind of initial shock into subsequent stages and start coming to grips, um, we found that actually consumers are looking potentially for less support and more action from brands. They want them to focus on solutions, not just selling. The only way are relevant. And again, I think that's an important point and also touches on that authenticity. Um, it doesn't need to be complicated. So on a very simple level, um, I'm getting emails from lots of different companies at the moment saying, you know, telling me that they think they're thinking of me. Not so relevant. 
But um, straight of genius, Nando's um, have actually sent me recipe suggestions. And my kids who are completely bored of my cooking after four weeks at home <laughs> were really delighted last night to have a full on Nando's meal, um, including those Peri Peri Walker's crisps, um, which I think is absolutely genius and, and really um, makes me think very and feel very differently about the Nando's brand because I, you know, I'm, they're relating to me at home. And so, so we want brands to kind of demonstrate that they understand what they're going through, tell us how they can help or, or stay silent. And I think these initiatives of product lines might not generate huge profit in the short term, but in the longer term, they will pay for themselves because they will generate that brand loyalty. And that brings me nicely to purpose. So the business case for purpose-led brands is increasingly recognised. 70% um, agree that a brand's perceived quick profit of purposes, they, you know, they will lose trust in that brand forever. And again, Mark's going to talk about that a lot. But the one point I do want to make is that I think purpose as a concept is often misunderstood. It's not simply about being a good citizen. It's about recognising the genuine value you can add to society through your core products and services. Um, and there's been a very interesting case study in the UK recently with Gary Neville, who's a former Man United footballer, who's opened his hotel in Manchester to NHS staff. And of course, um, Zoe and I are both big fans of Joe Wicks, who's a British fitness instructor who has live workouts at 9 a.m. every morning to get the UK moving. And that feels very logical for him because he's a fitness instructor. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet seen it, I strongly recommend watching his Scooby-Doo puppy workout, particularly um, if you want to get yourselves up and moving in the morning. Authenticity. So um, it's really important to stress that companies that position themselves as purpose-led or sustainable are authentic. Consumers will no longer tolerate hypocrisy. There is a very good example of an asset management fund in the United States, and many of you will have seen the image of the girl facing down the bull in front of New York's New York Stock Exchange. It was, it was copied world over. The aim was to highlight the need for gender balance on boards, and it was hugely successful with about 200 different organizations appointing women as a result, or stating as a result of that campaign. But their brand equity was eroded six months later when the fund made the front pages for underpaying its female leaders. On the contrary, if your experience is authentic, people are five times more li likely to stay loyal. And that brings me to my final point, which is the employer brand. How you treat your people or the people upon whom you depend is going to be more important than ever in the wake of this pandemic. If we behave badly or you have your ethics called into question, you can very quickly end up on social media and also mainstream media as journalists are trawling through social media to understand sentiment. And according to one of the surveys that Mark's done, over one third of people in China, and, well, I think it's as high as 82% in China, say that they've started using a new brand because of the innovative and compassionate way that they have responded during the pandemic. So again, a real opportunity. And the best example, one of the best examples I've seen of that recently is, is the drinks industry in the US who have rallied around the bar, bartender community, recognising that they need tips to survive. And Diageo, I think, denoted a million, Bacardi, three million, a host of other high-profile drinks brands have donated into the bartender emergency assistance program. And that's a very savvy move as well, because, of course, that's part of their value chain. So in years to come, and again, Mark said this, the talent you're trying to attract into your business may well ask you what you did in the pandemic, you personally and you as an organisation. And I do think that's a really good thing because in the new world, trust combined with purpose and the ability to collaborate will be absolutely key. So however um, you are responding or managing your communications in the current crisis, do so with compassion and make a difference. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Anna. And um, firstly, lovely to see you drawing on so many themes that we had in our March workshop around authenticity and purpose and compassion and empathy, and also picking up on the many questions that we're getting um, in the chat around trust. So I'd now like to just hand back to Mark for our final few slides before we open it up to questions. Uh, and, and as I said at the beginning, we wanted to address this head on because obviously we've had lots and lots of questions around this. And, and Mark, I know that you've got some some new survey data from Edelman, um, which will sort of help people think about this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, it won't take long, but I think it feels really important to share with everyone. As Anna's reference, we are living in extraordinary times. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call are battling with children who are apparently homeschooling downstairs, 
you done Joe Wicks, you're trying to work out how your day is going to be any different from your kitchen to your lounge to your studies, back to your kitchen lounge study all over again. Same all over the world. Um, it's extraordinary times. We've never had anything like this in our, our lifetime, our parents' lifetime. Hopefully we will not experience it again in our own lifetimes. Um, what does it mean for brands? What does it mean for employers? And, and uh, what Anna raised is a really, really important point about um, the value of employers. Last year, we saw a huge change and employers became the most trusted institution in uh, an individual's life. Uh, probably in response to this VUCA world that Anna alluded to and described, which is it, things fell out of control and I feel unable to influence. And actually, the employer is probably the biggest institution that I come into contact with that I have some level of control over. I can talk to a line manager, I can quit my job, I can go somewhere else to work, I can ask for a different role within my company. It's probably the largest, most comforting in terms of the security offers institution, which I have a semblance of influence over. But it has really important role. This data I'm going to show you now was collated about three weeks ago in a 12 market study you can see on the screen there to understand how people, citizens around the world, were feeling about the, the pandemic and how companies were responding. So we jump on, please, Zoe. As mentioned before, um, we know that brands are uh, regarded to be people who can deliver the solutions we need, come up with the ideas that deliver them. So 62% are saying that the, we won't get through this without brands playing a critical role in the solutions we need to provide and what we then build out the back of the crisis. Overall as well, it's interesting, isn't it, to see these numbers and mirroring that they've got every Despite government turning, we haven't seen since, you know, Marshall Plan and Roosevelt, still they regard business and companies to be responding more quickly than government. So that's really telling that that remains true and that sentiment of speed of action. So what do they want people to do? Well, there is expectation on you. So if you're not doing that, they are also going to punish you. Now, this is also very striking. We spoke about um, the preference that will be delivered through doing the right thing. This is even stronger. This is telling you that I will, I will actually not only boycott you personally, I will encourage others to boycott you if I don't believe you stepped up. Um, I think it's quite clear in the, in the first three months of this crisis, the differential between the brands who are stepping up and the brands who aren't. I think it's almost becoming starker and more obvious, those companies that have the ability in their leadership teams and their resilience to actually step forward into the crisis and those who may be shrinking under the pressure of it. So you, we know consumers will remember that. Now, Anna Lutis is absolutely right. Now is the time to focus on solutions and not selling. It's a unique period where globally we face the same common enemy. We face the same number one challenge. There is only one priority on every boardroom's list, every citizen's um, life, and it is the same everywhere in the world, which is, the, is a unique experience. So it's about the solution to that challenge they want to hear about. And if we go forward, please, Zoe. So first of all, it's that role of employer again. It is about ensuring that your suppliers and your employees, 90% people believe you have number one responsibility is the core of what business has always done in society, which is provide the well-being through security of income, security of role of a job, and that needs to continue. And at all expense, they do expect businesses to take a short-term hit on this to try and keep individuals are being maintained. That includes their safety course at work. And if we go on again, it also means pivoting the business. They want to see products that help people meet challenges about solutions to what you build. It also means offering products to frontline staff and those who are most at danger, most vulnerable, who society as a whole feels now most indebted to. Discount products, free products. How are you helping those people who are really carrying the greatest burden from us all through this crisis? And we see many brands doing this brilliantly and stepping in with really meaningful solutions. And lastly, it's worth bearing in mind they're not looking for new products. They're not looking to browse and things that aren't related to this right now. That is why we're seeing such a steep decline in advertising, such a steep decline in lots of marketing campaigns. And it's right, because people are telling you, we don't want to see it. We don't want to be buying that stuff. Hopefully it will come back. But right now, there's no need for this. And how do they work? They need to work in, in hand and glove with government. They need to work in partnership with government. But it's really important that they that, that second chart there, the second slide, um, number on this slide rather, the safety net. They really do see business as being the catch-all. 
the people who will come up with things that maybe government lets slip, that they have an important role to fill the gaps in government's response. So the role is vital. And lastly, there is this real need, which is new. This is a new requirement of companies about being an information source, different to normal. We're not just asking you to tell us what time we should start work, what is our um, pension policy, what's, they're asking you to tell the information, they trust you more than any other source about what is the situation today? What is the state of coronavirus in our market globally? How are our colleagues surviving? What are we doing for our supply chain? How are we ensuring that we are stepping up the mark on this? And what should I be doing at home in my life? This is a new role for companies to play and making sure you do it competently and accurately at this time and with compassion, as Anna said, is really important. So finally, what should we do as a whole? Well, it's at this point, rightly and thankfully, the train to experts public want to hear from more from experts than ever before and understandably so so if you're dressed in a white coat and you work in a hospital right now people will listen to anything you've got to say but this man is the top of the tree on that this man is dr david navarro he's a who covid um special envoy and we've been working with him to make sure we stay across what's going on with the crisis uh, his words are um deeply compelling so i want to share them with you i'm asking everybody who's got the power to lead where they can and not to wait for permission. Here are things to stand by. You should be audacious, ambitious, authentic, and accountable in what you do. So if you're gonna start communicating around this and stepping forward into this challenge, to go forward, please, Zoe. And here are just four things to bear in mind, which I think really is what's been touched on today. You just show up and do your part. This is not a time to step back. It's not a time to disappear. There is an expectation on brands and companies to meet these challenges. There's a want for them to do it and there's a belief they can do it well. People want to see you doing that. Don't act alone. This is obviously is a huge problem, way beyond us, like other problems we face too, namely climate change, I'm sure will come, come up in discussions. But collaboration and collaboration at speed is, re is required and demonstrating that is required. Solve, not sell, I won't go over that. We've spoken about a lot, but it's about solutions to problems people face in the immediacy, in their everyday life during lockdown, you know, they need to have solutions offered to them. And communicate with emotion, but deliver with facts and action. People do want to know what's happening and how we're getting through this. You need to show compassion and understanding of, how, of what it feels like to be in this. You need to frame it correctly because facts on their own won't be received. But you, they also need to believe it's accurate so you can maintain the trust. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark, so much. And thank you, Anna, as well. Um, so and, and thank you to all of us who joined us for the questions and comments that are coming in. Uh, Mark, I just want to address the first one to you, um, if I may, just just picking up on this this point about trust. It's been a really um, strong theme uh, in the in the in the chat conversation was does does Edelman expect trust to change this year with COVID-19? Um, the question is asking the general perception, maybe some exceptions like the US, is that people are trusting governments more, especially as companies are letting people go, reducing payments, etc. Any predictions on on what might happen to trust? Yeah, so um, I think you know, where the questions led to is probably the category that will change most, which is government, um, because there is so in in our trust, we, we've broken down by, into what constitutes trust, how do you earn trust, what behaviours do you need to see, and, and really it's about the competence in, in the role you do, the dependability in that task, how much integrity do you have in doing that task, and whether you have a higher purpose, are you doing something in society, are you helping society move to a better place, are you dealing with some of the issues. Government has obviously been very, very poor, sorry, not obviously, government has been scoring very, very poorly on competency, the belief that it has the ability to solve solutions. Now, you're absolutely right. The government has stepped in in unprecedented ways as it needs to, and it will continue to do that as we move from a health issue to an economic issue. Um, the government intervention will be absolutely key, and we're already seeing it beginning in that response. How effectively it delivers that will obviously depend on the level of competency um, uh, scoring that they are gaining. Uh, we can see that they are. You know, there is a, a sense of, in, in, in UK, we're obsessed by referring to split spirit, this sense of this common enemy brings everyone together, and that has galvanised. Um, whether in the time passing, there will be some reviews of how well 
governments have actually performed, what errors they made. And already we're seeing comparisons between markets of governments that have done very well and very badly. That will no doubt play in. What is guaranteed is the government's going to have a bigger role in our lives than it has done for generations. Um, so I think the levels of trust from that will be how well they perform in that role. What is their level of confidence? How well they deliver against what they're promising? And of course, what we're paying for. So I think that the question is right to lead to government. That would be where we see the biggest changes. Um, some companies, I think, will perform very well as a whole sector, the private sector, I think, will be challenging because obviously there's going to be massive job losses. There's going to be incredible economic hardship. How much people take regard that as being the private sector or the private sector being a victim of that is um, a, a different matter to see how the public react. Level of trust has been very low for a long time. Um, I think what's also interesting in the current context is social media. We saw social media in the last few years really falling away. Technology has been the golden child of all industries, had levels of trust that every other industry would have, would have absolutely loved to reach. Um, in the last three years, we've seen that the general public's understanding to differentiate technology between social media platforms and technology as a whole had started to fall. Um, there was maturing and a differential between the platforms and the publishers was starting to mature. So you, we can see a return to um, journalism as a whole. Media consumption is rocketing right now and expert opinion is rocketing right now. There is a fear about fake news. And that is Actually, being Mark, Mark, I'm, Mark, I'm going to pause you there if you don't mind. Okay. So many questions and I would love okay. to try and get through a few more. And in fact, you've actually just um, segued to a topic that I wanted to um, pick up with Anna some because we've got a lot of questions in advance as well so it'd be lovely if we could try and get through as many questions as we can so so Anna three questions that I, I felt really talked to what you were addressing in in your piece there that I'll, I'll just lay out for you to see if you've got any other additional comments if that's okay uh, and, and we've had a sort of a bunch of questions around how to be relevant and genuine in a changing communications landscape so three aspects so the one that mark was just picking up on there so how to deal with digital communication and judgment on real versus fake you know i.e losing all the cues from mm -hmm. from real life comms a second one around how to craft and spread worth to worth to be listened info in the current information landscape um you know, an, an overload when we're exposed to it. So, you know, how do we how do we keep our our communications relevant? And then something you picked up. What are the best ways to communicate in a balanced way? So, empathetic with some authority and with hope and power. So, sort of the broad bucket here is how to be relevant and genuine in a changing communications landscape, and and how to deal with digital judgment on real versus fake. Would love a sort of a sixty seconds thoughts on that yeah i will be snappy so it's interesting um, we produce a survey every year um where we survey um about forty thousand people called the digital society index and we look at their behavior and internet use and i think 46 percent of people responded to come back and say they're suffering from information overload but what we find is the more sophisticated people's skills are um, the more able they are to control that information, install ad blockers, for example. So I think skills are really important. The second thing I would say is that behaviour on the online world is no different to behaviour in the real world in many ways. And actually, we advise our children, you know, from a very early age to, you know, a strange danger, to, to be alert when crossing a, a road, to be careful what they hear. Um, we need to supply, we need to apply that same judgment to, to social media and actually be really considered about what we hear, um, filter it, um, question information we don't necessarily believe is authentic. And if we, if we see unethical behaviour, we need to call that out as well as consumers, because that's, I think, you know, a way that we can affect change. Um, people often talk about increased regulation. It's very difficult to regulate a world that moves um, at that speed. Um, in terms of um, balance, I think, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about authenticity. Um, if you want to get communications cut through at this time, uh, be empathetic. Think about what your consumers or your audience are actually going through. Be relevant in terms of the information you communicate. Part the stuff that can wait um, and then revisit at a later time. So again, I think we've touched a lot on those, that found, you know, themes about solutions and selling and authenticity. 
um, and 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 demonstrate that you are you know you are acting in the best interests. Um, we've seen some people, some very well-known people, fall foul over the last few days by coming out and you know communicating in a way that has felt self-serving, and the Twitter RT has responded rapidly. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. And. Um, so many brilliant questions coming through. Clearly, this could put lots and lots of questions still about trust, etc. But one I'd like to address: we focused very much on brands and, and B2C organisations in this conversation so far. And two questions that have come in through through the chat. One earlier. So, you no, know, do two parts. And Anna, I'll start with you first, and then go to Mark if that's okay. So, do the same principles apply for? for B2B companies as well as B2C. And then um, a different question, um, which I think is a really, really important one is, now how about the other crisis, the climate crisis? Um, the question was many companies that play a big role are not brands, but are resource companies like mining companies, oil and gas, agroforestry, et cetera. How is trust going to change for these resource companies and what should these companies do differently in the post COVID world? So, Anna, a few thoughts for you before I um, hand yeah, it over. Yeah, I, I, I think I'll start with the second part of that question, actually, because it is really, really important. I think one of the challenges that we've wrestled with um, from a sustainability perspective over recent years is that it's actually been very, very difficult for people to imagine what a huge system level shock would look like to society and to the economy. And in some way, COVID-19 has actually created that reality for people to understand. And I think what we need to ensure as we come out of this pandemic is that people understand the link between COVID-19, biodiversity loss, um, how that is an example of a global megatrend, a system level shock, how fragile and interconnected our society and economy is and our businesses is, and that that is probably one of many shocks we may see over the next 5, 10, 15 years if we don't start to behave in a way that's different. We will see a response, and I think increasing response and demand from investors. So Mark touched on ESG. Um, in the last 12 months, 12 months ago, we weren't getting questions from investors on ESG, but now about 80% of our investors are asking us those questions, increasingly so. I think in, in the wake of the pandemic, investors will be looking to see how organisations are prepared for this, this scale of disruption, and, and we'll be seeing those that haven't. Um, so, so I think that's that's an opportunity, and we need to really, really make sure that we that we get on the agenda. Talking of digital communications and, and the changing world, I was delighted to see that Earth Day actually did take place yesterday. There may not be two million people on the streets, but it was certainly the largest environmental conference online. Um, so, so it's good to see that conversation continuing. Super, thank you, Anna. Um, Mark, any thoughts from you on this one? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, B two B companies, uh, the principles are the same. You know, you are members of the world. You've got your employ citizens. You're working with regulators who are citizens. You know, so the right behaviours are expected of you, and they're different behaviours. So it gives you license to operate with regulators. It gives you that strong relationship with your stakeholders, with your suppliers, and of course, you guys have customers too, who are people. You have people who you want to work with you and for you. The scale and the reach of your some of your communications around it may be slightly different. Obviously, much more targeted to much narrower and sharper audiences. Um, but the principles we've shared today are no different. Um, it's simply the role that people expect of business and brands um, in the world today. And the execution may be slightly different. Um, climate crisis is obviously um, an ongoing challenge and, and I know you've all been across the conversations about how interesting it is the response to the pandemic versus climate crisis and only, if only we could get the urgency uh, that we've shown the pandemic to the climate crisis. Yeah, there's, there's, an, important, um, there's an important uh, parallel that has to be navigated here that we don't try and encourage a conversation which is look how great the environment is now that we've turned everything off and in effect people are dying. That isn't the answer. The answer is yes, isn't it great that the environment can recover and we can show how different ways we can do things. But, the, but what we are aspiring for is a sustainable economy which delivers both rapid um, growth, rapid job creation, but also a more sustainable route through. Um, so for companies who are involved in that space, it's about defining the narrative what the new normal will be. Uh, we know we're in crisis stage and rapidly we'll be getting to a new normal. And right now already, is starting to be created and crafted 
where the large scale investments are placed by governments and by other institutions to get through and beyond and recover this part of the economy um, will really define whether we take the challenge of we have a decade to really reshape things. Um, and we have a great opportunity to, you know, in the normal context is we're nudging people through incremental changes in our current system, our current life. And in an unprecedented way, we've just stopped everything. So when we restart, we can also reset and we can really take this opportunity to really recalibrate some of the systems that the normal times take so much longer to Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. We Mark. might have Thanks, so just a quick build yeah. on that. We might yeah, actually sure. see that people are more open to sustainable lifestyle now that they've actually gone back to basics in their homes, um, gardening, you know, um, cooking from scratch. Um, these are all ways of living a much more sustainable lifestyle back on their bicycles. So it'll be interesting to see if we can maintain that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to try an experiment now. I'm bringing kind of three threads of questions together a couple in advance and um a couple on the on the chat so so where we've got to a few things to chuck into the mix now I'll, I'll just get you to sort of give broad brush uh comments both of you to this so so earlier on in the chat we had the question if capitalism is so culturally ingrained how can we change it it picks up on what you just said anna um do you think, we would question in the chat, do you think sustainability, the definition of sustainability will be changed now? Um, and then sort of related, it's just really around this whole issue of um, communicating the importance of purpose in an environment which is more comfortable talking about commercial imperatives. So this whole purpose versus profit, what do we mean by sustainability? How can we convey the urgency of, of sustainability? Any thoughts? Not even sure if that's a coherent question. I, I do think I, I don't think the definition of sustainability will change, but I do think understanding might deepen. So I think um, people begin to affect change when they start to experience it themselves personally. And one thing that we saw last year, I think, with the water shortages in South Africa, was that women had to start to cut their hair because they could no longer wash it. When, um, when uh, you know, global sort of megatrends begin to impact consumers and citizens in their homes, you start to see powerful change. Um, and, and what social media has done has given you know, citizens and people that voice and that and that ability to start to to affect change at a global scale. And we saw that with the Extinction Rebellion when they when they brought London to a close and, and we, you know, implemented a zero zero carbon target. So I think it is really powerful what consumers can do. And one thing I would say is that um, um, capitalism, I think I think that's on everybody's lips at the moment. We've just talked about that. Global system shocks, high levels of awareness, investor behavior changing. Um, you know, the shock market has, the shock market, that was an accidental um, uh, expression there, the, the shock waves rippling through the stock market, I think, are going to um, as create increasing demand for investors and answers from, from investors. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Mark, any thoughts? Yeah, I think just reiterating Anna's points and also just going back to that point, in the question is kind of, it's alluding to behaviour change, it's alluding to are we entrenched in one way and are, are we describing sustainability in a way which is slightly counter to that and is it, is it even biting and resonating? I think it goes back to the point I'm, I made earlier in this difficult time and it is of course an incredibly difficult time, the silver lining for me is we've never had a chance to reset things. We've ne it, it, it's true capitalism is ingrained, our behaviours are ingrained, we've never had a cultural awakening, um, we've never had an economic awakening that we're about to experience because it's forced on us. So it's really upon us as you know this community and those people who are beyond or not on the webinar but in the same space to ensure that when we're re when we're drafting and hand planning and, and trying to guide what the new normal will look like we ensure that it is a different version of capital we ensure that if we're going to have consumption it's more sustainable consumption we ensure these behaviors are normal and, and personally if sustainability as a word is not used as much i have no problem with that because you know we we fail to make it really cut through in the mainstream for so many years um, if the you know the ambitions are the same, but we have a different vernacular and we're placed in culture. And, and as Anna alluded to, if it turns up to things like cutting your hair shorter because it's better, for the, it's better, then that's absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be labelled as sustainability. And whatever the examples are that from around the world. Um, so, so I think there are, that's the silver lining from all of this. Is there is an opportunity to reset. 
Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So um, probably last round of questions. Um, and thank you all, everybody on the call in advance for so many fantastic questions. Um, so I want to take us back to um, the way we set this up at the beginning. So this is our advancing leadership webinar series. And we're talking about communicating for leadership influence and impact. And I, I just want to, to bring our questions around to um, sort of leadership and communication. So, so, to, so a couple of questions really to, to put into the mix. First one is um, a, a common theme that we see, which is just you know, this, this issue we just touched on purpose versus profit, short term versus long. So the question is how to communicate on long term issues to, to leaders who are proponents of near term wins. Any um, any any quick examples really of success? And the second one was just more broadly, um, and I think very much picks up on what both of you said earlier. So what kind of leadership should we expect now from business leaders? Um, do we think there'll be changes in, in leadership structure? So so really it's like how do we take, how do we expand leadership, use the benefits of communication, influencing for instance, influence and impact, take people from short-termism to long-termism and what's the kind of leadership we want now? I, I personally think that we need leaders who um, are system thinkers. I think there is a um, there is a gap between the leadership that we have and the leadership that we need. People because we have interdependent the systems are. Um, people talk about the pandemic without actually necessarily considering why to cause the pandemic and the link to food shortages and biodiversity loss. And I think people understanding that role and, for example, you know that women and girls and gender, for example, and how that connects with, with issues like climate and health and well-being. It's really important that we have leaders who can see that system. In terms of creating that longer term view, I know Zoe, one of the things that you always talk about is the power of stories. Um, and Polly, Polly Porter's put out this really sort of powerful piece about talking about the future that we want and the future that we can imagine. So I do think we have to create that longer term vision and then break that down into a very practical pathway. Um, one of the think tools that I think works really, really well for all sustainability professionals in business is the financial and the financial team. So when you are communicating sustainability, talking about cost transformation in financial terms, talking about risks and opportunities in financial terms, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I have an extremely enlightened CFO, um, but if I need to have a conversation with him about systems we need to implement, you know, we, we do talk about it in that context and it becomes a very straightforward conversation to have. And I think for all the brands, I mean, I, I can't ask. I can't emphasize enough, this is an extinction time for brands. You know, businesses will be disrupted at a phenomenal scale. And the ones that will survive will be the ones that fundamentally rethink their business models to minimize the risk created by the global megatrends, but also capitalize upon those future opportunities. And those that do will be prepared. And I think Unilever is a really interesting example of that because they started thinking about this 10 years ago and it set them up very, very well. Um, and they've taken a very proactive stance, not just in cleaning up from plastic, but recognizing that they need to clean up everybody else's as well. So it's, it, and that's real leadership is thinking 10 years ahead. And we do have the benefit of some really good case studies, really profitable case studies with our portfolio growing 47% faster, the sustainability portfolio growing 47% faster than any other brands. And I think it's that kind of data that really helps us build the business case. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Um, pulled together so many threads. Mark, last comment from you before we close, if I may. Yeah, I know there's only a minute left. So I think um, it, let's not underestimate how difficult the long term and short term conversation is going to be with the enormous short term pressures that all businesses will face in the next um, 12 months. Uh, so for all of you out there, I, I have a huge sympathy for the pressures that you're facing. The opportunity, I think um, Anna alluded to in the closing of her section, actually, is the parallel to you know, the, a key word we're going to hear lots of going forward is resilience and realizing how many of our systems weren't built with much resilience in them is what we've learned from the pandemic and so resilience is of course something we've we're, we're very we, we struggle to fathom as individuals because the long term is hard to understand however suddenly you've seen we've all seen the effects of pandemics things that you couldn't imagine have become real and so this is the same for climate change i think if you frame your long-term objectives in resilience no one will question the opportunity that presents to a business. In terms of leadership, 
I think we need a huge amount of compassion, um, really displayed by some leaders in the world right now, and very well displayed by others. That isn't to mean it's not strong leadership. You know, you're also going to need to be required to be strong in your decision making, strong because your your workers, your employees, your partners will really need guidance through what is going to be turbulent times, but compassion to show you understand how it feels and how best we're going to get through this together. Um, is what I'd say we want from you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. So our our, our final slide um, before we close is um, brilliant segue from Anna, and we, we talked about it. It's brilliant at the beginning. Watch out for the new leadership platform coming from CISL, the future we want. Should also say uh, we think this is such an important topic. We've actually created a new online course for it, and Anna and Mark indeed are both speakers on that course, online course, and it's called Communicating for Influence and Impact, which launches on May 13th. More information on our website in the, and in the full up email we send you. And hope to see many of you on next month's webinar on common leadership dilemmas and solutions. Many other topics have come up, such as gender, diversity, inclusion, and trust that we might want to dig into more in the future. Um, but um, more from us. In the meantime, I'd like to say thank you so much to Anna and Mark um for such fantastic contributions and to all of you who've joined us and are watching the recording afterwards thank you so much thank you zoe thank you